Um, we are working through the life of Moses, and the title we have today is to remember. And in, sometimes when you're in a Bible study or in a sermon, a message, you're looking at one scripture. Sometimes you're looking at a text, and sometimes you're you're taking a big perspective, and sometimes that gives you some insight that you don't have from just looking at one particular text or scripture. And that's what we're going to do today as we are thinking about faith in regards to chapter 11 in the book of Hebrews, and we think about Moses and how God lived his life um, through him. And um, we had looked at Moses and, and the Israelites as they have come out of Egypt and as they have gone through the Red Sea. The Passover represents the application of the blood of the Lamb which the Israelites by faith applied to the uh, door of their homes and the death angel passed over their firstborn. And they believed God when they believed God's word and that they would be spared uh, by uh, applying the blood. And of course, this represents justification. God brought them out of the Exodus, out of Egypt, into uh, to the Red Sea, and there He delivered them through the waters, a wall on the left and a wall on the right, and He um, closed the water thereof over all the Egyptians, and they all died, but Israel uh, was delivered, speaking about our baptism. And our baptism speaks about not only the death and the burial of Jesus Christ, but His resurrection. That once we were dead, and God gave us a brand new life. But then the Bible says that the Israelites were led into the wilderness by God. The Hebrew word for test is only used in the Exodus account during the first three months and three days. And so uh, God led Israel to be tested. This word speaks about sanctification. Once you become a believer, you follow the Lord and believer's baptism as a symbol, then what are you going to do with your life? God could have just taken you to heaven could have just killed you on the spot when you got saved and taken you to heaven, but he didn't do that. Why? He left you on the earth. Why? Because he has a work for you to do. He has a plan and a purpose for your life in, on this planet. And that's for you to live your life for him. How are you going to do that? How are you going to be prepared to do that? The test that God gives to Israel is a test that precursors ministry. It's always been that way with the Lord, and it continues to be that way today. The Lord in the New Testament references what God did uh, here in the Exodus, because God is saying, I want to use these people and their experience as examples for you, because you have to learn how to live your life before God. How are you going to do that? We can learn from their mistakes, their failures, their sins, and their successes. And so it is uh, beneficial for us to look back, and it's a good thing for us to do. So Israel is basically going to be given three tests in those first three months and three days. And so the first test is going to come up in uh, Exodus 16. The second one will come up in Exodus 17, and the, second, the third one will come up in Exodus 18 through 20. We're going to look at that just briefly and see what God did there, and then we're going to see the correlation between the tests and the way that God tested Israel, and we'll see that God tested His Son in the same way in Luke chapter 4 and the parallel in Matthew chapter 4 as Jesus went into the wilderness. And then finally, we'll come to an end and a conclusion, and we'll see this correlating with Luke chapter 22 in the Last Supper slash Passover, which becomes the Lord's Supper which is what we're going to observe at the end of the service. The key word, though, I want you to remember is the word remember. 
This is where we want to go with all the facts and the information and the details that I'm going to give you. And I want to come back to the Ark of the Covenant as that will play into what we're going to say when thinking about this word remembrance. In Exodus uh, chapter 16, um, the Israelites are going to get hungry. Uh, in 17, they're going to get thirsty. And here, they're going to be tested in uh, terms of the kingdom of the priesthood. But the first one is going to happen is they're going to get hurt. And you got two million Israelites coming out of Egypt. It's a daunting thought to bring two million people, kids, adults, teenagers, and lots of animals into the wilderness. You know, the wilderness is, they call it that for a certain reason. It's, a, it's barren. It's not like you've got water everywhere, food everywhere. Both of those items are scarce, hard to find. There's no HEBs in the wilderness. It's a tough place, and it's a dry place. It's a hot place. There are, there's no motels along, the, si uh, along the, 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 the road there. In fact, there's no porta potties this is a difficult, daunting task. And the Israelites um, are going to get hungry. They're supposed to get hungry. They're going to get thirsty. They're supposed to get thirsty. They're, this, what happened is, didn't catch God off by surprise. God planned all of this. You know, the Israelites should have been thinking that. They should have been thinking God was at work and he has a plan and he has a purpose. Why? Because they just got through seeing what God did to deliver them out of Egypt. They just got through seeing what God had done to deliver them through the Red Sea. And now, even now, as they go into the wilderness, the Bible says that God presented himself to them by a pillar by cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. In other words, they could visually see the presence of God. As he was leading them, what was God saying to them? I'm with you. I'm not, I'm not, I haven't gone anywhere. And the power that I had and, I, and that my person that I demonstrated in Egypt, it's right here in the wilderness too. Nothing's changed except for your geographical location. But Israel, they weren't thinking like that. Uh, they had some stinking thinking going on. Some negative thoughts. There were a lot of melancholies in this group. They saw the glass half empty. God wants us to learn from this group because it's easy to get negative, isn't it? It's easy to get critical. It's easy to blame other people. It's easy to say, God, where, where were you? And so we can really learn from what happens. So anyway, they get hungry, and so they start complaining before the Lord. And... Uh, instead of trusting the God. And so God uh, delivers to them uh, manna. They wake up in the morning, and they go outside, and they see something like snowflakes. And when the dew finally lifts off, <clears throat> they, they see this stuff on the ground, and they call it manna. Well, the word manna means, what is it? They didn't know what it was. That's what, that's what manna means, what is it? So they went over there, and, uh, and they got it. The Lord instructed them uh, to pick up the manna. The manna uh, tasted real sweet. It was bread. Uh, it tasted like it had honey in it. But God gave them instructions about the manna. Now, he's going to give them quail in the evening uh, for meat, but he's going to give them bread in the morning, this manna. And God gave them specific instructions. Now, think about this. What's the test? What's the test about getting manna? By the way, for 40 years, they're going to have two miracles happen every day of the week, well, five days of the week, right? For 40 years, five days of the week, a miracle of manna in the morning and quail in the evening. But on the, on the sixth day, they're going to get a double portion. So they're going to get four miracles that day because that, that food won't spoil going into the next day. So what's the test? What's the big test with that? I mean, if you had a miracle every day in your life, how's that a test? That's a good question, isn't it? Now think about it. And, and this is what the Lord wants us to do. When you're reading 
these stories, when you're reading the Word of God, put yourself in the situation. Go back there. Think about it. Don't just run through it. So you're an Israelite, okay? That means you're probably kind of stinky. There's no showers out there. And you're hungry. Now they go out there, and there is more manna than is needed for two million people. But you're hungry. Your kids are hungry. Your animals are hungry. But what does God say? We're just reviewing here. He says, go out there and pick up enough manna just, here's my paraphrase, to meet your need. Don't get more than you need, but you're hungry. Did you know that they tell us, don't go to H-E-B when you're hungry? (laughs) Isn't that true? You come back with $3,000 worth of groceries because you were hungry. No, eat before you go. Well, these people are hungry, and so they're out there with all this manna. And what's the temptation? What's the test to take more than you need? Do you know what uh, a storage room is? It's a place for things that are more than what we need. That's what that is. When you go to third world countries, if you were in the storage business, you would go bankrupt. They don't have storage. They don't have garages. I remember one time using an illustration about the backyard over in the Philippines. And they said, after I got through, they said, they don't even know what a backyard is. They don't have a backyard. So the test here is that Israel would obey the Lord when he told them how much food to get. Would they obey him? So the test was to trust, and the way we trust the Lord is through obedience. Okay? Then secondly, we get, they get thirsty. This happened, uh, by the way, this one happened about a month and a half after the Exodus. Now we're just shy of another month and a half. And this one's going to be on the third day, third month and third day. This test, now we're almost a month and a half later after the hunger test, they're going to get thirsty. One time I fasted while I was in college and and I was uh, playing football at SFA and I had read about King David when he went on a hard fast um, when he was praying for his child with Bathsheba. Hard fast is a fast where you don't have food or water. And so I did that for three days while I was playing football. I would not suggest that anybody do that, even if you're not playing football. Don't do that. It's not good for your kidneys, your organs, and all that kind of stuff. It's bad. But I didn't know that. I was just a dumb college kid. And I'm telling you, man, that third night, wow, I was thirsty. I I was thirsty, and my legs started cramping really bad, and you could barely swallow. I could barely swallow in my throat. And then the next morning, the fourth morning, when I got up, I went to the cafeteria and I couldn't wait, you know, to finally get a drink. And it was like, it wasn't, it wasn't enjoyable because my throat was like sandpaper. It was so coarse. Well, these people, they're in a similar predicament. And it's not just mom and dad, it's their kids and their animals. They're all thirsty. But again, they should have known, they should have, should have known from what's happened in the past that God had a plan. God had a purpose. God was going to meet their needs. God didn't bring them out in the wilderness so he could kill them. No. So they, they complained before the Lord. In fact, they complained that um, this is really bad. This complaint goes even an extra mile because they present themselves before the presence of the Lord in the pillar of cloud. And they say, if you're really among us, then you'll give us water, basically, is my summation of what they said. And so Moses goes out, God instructs him to take his staff, this is manna over here, take his staff and to strike the rock and water will come out. The same staff that Moses used to touch the Nile. 
And for God to take the water away from the Egyptians, God used the staff of Moses to strike the rock. And of course, the New Testament tells us that rock that they drank from was Christ himself. And so uh, they, God gives them water, but they complained and, and, uh, bitterly. And the, the test was to trust the Lord and the demonstration of that trust as opposed to just obedience is not to try the Lord. In Luke 7, 32, the Lord Jesus says, this generation is like the generation that says, go, you'll have to go out in the street and dance and play the flute for us before we will believe. Here's what the Israelites were saying. They were saying, we don't believe you. You're going to have to show yourself. You're going to have to do something for us before we will trust you, before we will believe you. And God wants us to trust him by sight or by faith. Certainly by faith he wants us to do that and so to not try him. And then finally um, in chapters 18 through 20, chapter 18 Jethro shows up. That's his father-in-law, brings uh, Zipporah and his two sons as well. And Jethro sees what Moses is trying to do, trying to judge all the people. And he instructed Moses, he suggested, he said, um, let the people sacrifice to the Lord and then set up judges because you can't do all this by yourself, all by yourself. Those two things speak of the priesthood, sacrificing and judging. God had told Israel, and he's going to in this, this particular text, that he, and he had planned all along for them to be a kingdom of priests. Not to have one tribe, but for all of them to be priests. In this text, God is going to actually, they'll actually make it down to Mount Sinai, and there they will see the Ten Commandments from God. But then something's going to happen. Um, you're going to have the golden calf experience the great sin of Israel and they will thereby forfeit their right, their privilege, the purpose that God had in their, in their lives to be a kingdom of priests. And there was only one tribe that was obedient during that experience and that was the tribe of what? Of Levi. And so the Levites became the priests of God as opposed to God's original plan where the whole nation would be a kingdom of priests. Someday God would have a whole nation that will be a kingdom of priests, which we'll mention a little bit later. The test here on the priesthood in Mount Sinai was holiness and to fear the Lord. Don't come near, God said. If you get too close, you'll die. And be holy. When God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, it was like God saying, this is my calling card. This is what I'm like. This is what I want you to be like. And so this kingdom of priests, God was going to use this nation of Israel, all of them, to reach out through the Messiah to reach everyone in the whole world. Of course, Israel later will reject Jesus as their Messiah, but someday they will accept him, the third that are left during the last, seven, the last of the seven years of tribulation, so that they will come as well. Now, um, the Lord parallels this. There's a correlation when we get to Luke chapter 4 or Matthew chapter 4. Jesus was baptized and after his baptism as a preparation for a ministry, he was led where? Into the wilderness by who? By the Holy Spirit to do what? To be tempted by the devil, to be tested just as Israel was. But Israel failed, but our Lord will not fail. He was perfect at every point, every facet. He never yielded to any temptation even though he was dealt a blow from the fullest way the devil could tempt him. And so the Lord takes him, the Father takes him uh, through the Spirit into the wilderness and there he gives him three temptations. And the first one concerns what? 
concerns bread. Um, Jesus said in John chapter um, 4, no, in John chapter 6, he said, your ancestors ate of the manna in the wilderness and died. But whoever eats the bread from heaven will live forever. And when Jesus said that, he had just got through saying, I am the bread of life. John chapter 4, he said, my food is to do the will of my Father. And so the Lord was going to be tested with food, with bread. Why? Because he'd been fasting for 40 days and the Bible says he was hungry. And so the devil comes to him and he says, hey, I want you to... Um, make these stones into bread if you're really the son of God. And what did Jesus say? He quoted Deuteronomy chapter eight. And he said, man shall not live by, the bread, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. A lot of people, they read that text in the New Testament and they think Jesus just came up with a new scripture. No, he quoted the text from Moses as Moses was refer referring to Exodus chapter 16. When the children of Israel got hungry and they complained before the Lord. And so what was the test? And certainly the Lord could do that, but he didn't do that. Why? Because he didn't come to do his own will, but to do the will of his father. And that means to do the will of the father, you're going to do it God. Listen now, you're going to do it God's way in God's time. See, Israel failed in that, but our Lord didn't. I'll tell you what a lot of people do, a lot of Christian people. We're talking about sanctification. I'm not talking to lost people, I'm talking to saved people. They come to church and they have expectations. You're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're going to say this, you're going to say that, you're not going to do this, you're not going to do that. And when those expectations sometimes aren't met, you know what some people, some Christians do? They say, I'm going to pick up my toys and I'm going to go home. That's what they do. That's what the children of Israel did. You see, they, they said, God, you're supposed to be on our timetable. You're going to do it our way. You know, the Christian who is walking with God, and that is the wilderness experience. The tests come in the wilderness so that you can learn how to walk with God. When you're walking with God, you know what you're saying? Lord, you can do it however way you want to do it and whenever you want to do it. Lord, I am, not, I am going to resist the temptation to pick up my toys and go home. And the people do that all the time. They get offended, you know, they get sad, they get their feelings hurt. You didn't do what you said you were going to do. You, hey, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that you submit to the Lord's methods and the Lord's timing. That's what matters. And unless you do that, you can't walk with God. So first test, check, check. Second test, Luke and Matthew. Uh, Matthew has it in chronological order. Luke doesn't. So they, uh, Luke mixes it up a little bit. So the <clears throat> uh, devil takes him where? Um, to the pinnacle of the temple. Uh, Alice and I, we've been there to the highest place where the temple was when we went to Jerusalem. This is where the devil would have taken Jesus. It's where they would blow the shofar at certain times. And he quoted a scripture to him. And he said, uh, hey, uh, Lord, if you'll just uh, jump off of this uh, temple here, the Bible says that the angels will catch you because God won't let your foot dash on the, on the ground and, and get hurt. And what did the Lord say? What did Jesus say? He said, um, no, I'm not doing that. And he said, the Bible says, you're not to tempt the Lord, your God. That would be, again, that scripture in Luke chapter 7, chapter 32. When the Israelites got thirsty, they said, if you're really for us, if you're really with us, then you'll give us water to drink. Here's what's happening here. In other words, testing the Lord is saying, God, you will dance for me before I will do what you say, before I will believe you. You will play your flute. I will see you in action before I will, I will adhere. That's what the Israelites did basically in the thirsty episode. That's what the devil was wanting our Lord to do. 
to test the Lord. No, we are to obey the Lord, and the demonstration of that is not only by saying, God, you can do it your way and in your time, but I will not try you. I will not test you. Whatever you want to do is fine. Check. Third one. The devil brings him where? He brings him on the mountaintop so he can see all of the kingdoms of the world. And he says, if you'll just bow down and worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. And the Lord says, no, the Bible says, the word of God says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only be gone from me, Satan. What was the offer? The offer was that he was going to be able to to get uh, us back in under his authority and his kingdom by avoiding the cross. It was never going to happen. Never going to happen. Lord, I'm going to do that. You see, because by obeying the Lord, our Lord became, this is a big mess here now, let me start over. By obeying the Lord, our Lord became our great, eternal, high priest. And, was a, and since he was able to do that, he now has a kingdom of priests in his kingdom. Now, this kingdom that exists on the earth Is it a literal kingdom? No. Can you see it? No. Can you can you go to where the Lord's seated on his throne and and go and worship him physically in in you know three D? No. This kingdom is invisible, but it is a kingdom that is real. And so if we can't see it, how does it operate? It operates by authority. And so what the Lord wanted Israel to do, and being a kingdom of priests, is to fear him and walk in holiness so that they could fulfill this and branch out to the rest of the world. They failed. Not our Lord. Check. Perfect. He did what Israel could never do. And he submitted to the authority of his father. My father is greater than I. Now, that's because he added humanity to himself and he humiliated himself by becoming a man, God man. And in his humanity, he submitted to the authority of the Father, and he submitted by never yielding to temptation, by going to the cross, even to death, dying on a cross. Because he was obedient as the God-man, he became our great eternal high priest. Now, as we begin to close and think about this, this leads us to Luke chapter 22. Here, we see these these tests in action again. And the first test was failed by Judas Iscariot. When the devil left Jesus during the time of the wilderness and the testing, the Bible says he left him until an opportune time came again. That's this time right here. There Judas decided that he was going to force Jesus to announce himself as king and take over the kingdom. Why would Judas want that? Because he's going to be next in line to have all this power. And the Bible says that the devil in his betrayal entered him in his life, and there he betrayed our Lord. What he was doing was he was saying, I'm going to do it in my own time and in my own way. That'll never work. And it didn't work for him. And then when we think about um, this kingdom 
of priests idea of the priesthood we think of the disciples during this this is the last supper by the way <clears throat> which turns into the Lord's Supper Passover last supper Lord's Supper the disciples didn't do didn't fare so well either what were they doing during the Last Supper they were arguing among themselves what were they arguing who was going to be the greatest and so what did Jesus do how did he respond to that argument that the disciples had he went over and he got a bowl of water he got a towel and he knelt down and he started washing the feet of each of the disciples he was saying let me tell you how the priesthood works the son of man came to not to be served but to serve the way the priesthood works through authority how do you take authority and by the way he did he cast out demons he healed people and he taught the word of God and he loved people and he spoke the truth even when people didn't want to hear it even when they didn't like what he had to say even knowing that they were going to crucify him for it he still spoke what his father gave to him he took authority but he did so through the medium of servanthood and so this is what our Lord is teaching the disciples And then thirdly, he said, let me tell you what's coming. Lots of trouble for you guys. He said, but don't test the Lord. Don't try him. Trust him. Now, what's interesting, as we close, <clears throat> as you go over here to the Ark of the Covenant, and there are three items that God instructed Israel to put in the Ark of the Covenant. You remember what they were? Manna, the staff of Moses, and what else? The Ten Commandments. And now we know what these three represent, don't we? holiness and fear right what does manna represent trust me by obeying me trust me by not trying me and why did God instruct Moses and Aaron to put this stuff in here remember so that Israel would remember. No wonder when we come to the Last Supper, which Jesus instituted to be the Lord's Supper, that our Lord said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. There's something about our memories that play a huge part in sanctification. And so when we observe the Lord's Supper, our great eternal high priest ministers to us. He helps us through the Lord's Supper to remember what Jesus did for us. But secondly, I would say, the Lord's Supper is one way we do that, but the other one that's just as important, if not more important, is what we do every day in our prayer time. Every day in my prayer time, I have confessions written down that cause me to remember what God has done in my life. What God has done for me. In the past, in the present, and in the future. Why do I do that? Because to God, it's very important for us, for me, to remember what he's done. It will help you in your Christian life. 
so that you can follow the purpose of God and hopefully now pick up your toys and go home. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, once again for reminding us of what we need to know. Maybe we already knew, but we needed to be reminded. Remembrance is a wonderful thing. And we're thankful for the memory banks you've given us. Not just the short term, but most importantly, the long term memory you've given us. But help us to reinforce it with the Word of God. Not only when we come to church, not only through the Lord's Supper, but even in our prayer time. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.